So I, I wanted to share with you today a couple of thoughts about, about writing music, which is something that I've doing that I've been doing more and more of. And um, I find it quite challenging to find ways of practicing composition in the same way you would practice your instrument. Um, and so I've tried to come up with with a method of sorts that that helps me so that when I sit down, when I have time to write, um, to have a place to start and to have kind of a, a framework um, and a way of trying new things and making sure I'm covering new ground um, and also a way of incorporating material from the music that I love to listen to uh, in my own compositions without copying it. Um, so it seems to be true across disciplines that it's it's really hard to just sit down uh, and start writing you know whether it's it's a book or whether you're a sculptor or whatever um it's often much more productive if you have um a way of structuring things and the degree of structure it seems is, is different for each person you know some some people are much more kind of wildly creative and others need, need more of kind of a system uh to their approach um, so please feel free to interpret whatever I say um, according to, to you know, your your own personality and, and, and uh, the way you deal with these these things generally. And um, so when I write music, um, a lot of my method is based on analysis through the seven parameters of music. Um, and there's some discussion about this, but the seven parameters that most people, most musicologists agree on. Um, so the seven categories that in their totality make up music, right? So the seven parameters, seven ingredients are uh, melody, harmony, rhythm, um, tempo or time, and then texture, dynamics and form. Um, so if you add these seven things up, you'll get, you know, music. Um, and so the first benefit of, of approaching music this way, um, for me is when I analyze the music that I like to listen to. Um, and I want to show you how I go about this. So I'm going to share my screen with you. So this has been very, very helpful. Um, meaning dividing up your, your, your attention in these seven categories. Um, just to, to, to uh, end up with, with kind of uh, uh, manageable amounts of, of information so that, that a composition you're listening to is not, not overwhelming, uh, but you have the opportunity to focus on different aspects of it each time you listen to it. Um, so here's a, a listening exercise that I use quite a bit as kind of a scan. So when I come across a piece of music that I that I like a lot, um, I want to figure out certain things about it, and I want to kind of figure out where the magic is, you know, where the area of my my focus is going to be, um, or in other words, what I what I like so much about it, you know. Um, so so these are the questions that I try to answer with this kind of parameter scan or whatever you, you would like to call it. So why does this piece of music sound so good? Why do I, why do I like it so much? And how can I use some of these ideas and, and concepts to develop into my own vocabulary, into my own music, right? Um, so I will, I will send this to you, uh, this exercise. So here's a, here's a list of suggestions to try this exercise with, but you can you can do this virtually with any type of music. So with different types of, of music, different parameters are, are more kind of interesting or more dense. Um, so I, I always start with, with the parameter form. So this is the first thing I want to figure out. And the idea is you play the same piece of music seven times in a row. Um, you start with the parameter form and then the other six parameters in real time and you just try to write down anything and everything you notice, but you focus on one parameter at a time. So that's, that's 
the main idea here. Um, so again, this is like, like you're doing a scan of the piece of music to see where the most valuable, most interesting information is, right? So form, I try to answer these questions. So this really depends on, on, on the music, obviously. Uh, sometimes it makes sense to, to number or, or, or give a letter to each section of the composition. Sometimes it's much more kind of uh, uh, improvised or, or through composed. Uh, so these are things you'll, you'll find out along the way when, when you kind of spin it for the first time. Um, often for the parameter form, I listen to something twice or I, I, I rewind to kind of determine all the sections and make sure I, I, I have the right kind of light analysis, right? So things that are important to determine is does do things repeat, right? Is the form circular, meaning does it end with, with the same thing that's at the beginning, right? Or is something else going on, you know, is it is it completely kind of um, changing? Um, so how do the solos relate to the theme? These these are the type of questions I, I try to answer, you know, and, and there are no right and rights and wrongs there. You just write down whatever you notice for, for each parameter. And so each parameter has its own questions. Texture is kind of dense usually. So texture as a category um, in, includes things like timbre, uh, orchestration, instrumentation, but also production, right? So this is a very kind of broad uh, parameter. So anything involving sound basically. Um, so how do um, instruments blend together? What instruments are used, first of all? Uh, so try to jot this down while you listen to it the second time, for example, right? Are there any notable kind of uh, techniques being used in individual instruments like pizzicato and arco or sul tasto and sul ponticello or certain bowing techniques or, or um, flutter tongue, what, whatever it is, you know? Um, so try to write something about the production as well. Like, is it recorded inside or outside? What kind of room? Is it vintage? Is it hi-fi? Um, is there a lot of reverb or very little? Um, so quite a lot of information. So again, feel free to listen to it twice if you feel like there's more there for you to figure out. Um, and on and on for, for each parameter. So melody is a bit more technical. Uh, try to determine the shape of it. See if you can hear any uh, notable like, triads being used or uh, conjunct motion, meaning like skill, skill-like motion, stepwise motion, or more disjunct, meaning more jumpy. Um, see if there are certain intervals being used that are that are coming back, uh, like for example, uh, ESB by Wayne Shorter, you know, with all the fourths or. Um, so these are these are some of the questions I, I, I try to answer. So is something obvious, obvious going on, right? Is there a technique being used or a system or um, is there a climax that's an important one, you know, meaning is one of the notes highest or loudest or um, harmony. So again, start simple. Is it major, minor, bitonal, atonal, uh, microtonal, spectral? Um, is there a key? Does it modulate? And then when you've determined this, maybe you can comment on the voicings being used or even write down a, a bit of the progression, you know, the most important key centers. But remember, you're listening to it in real time, right? So you're just trying to kind of scan, trying to notice like, hey, I mean, something interesting is going on here, right? Rhythm, pretty self-explanatory. Um, what is the time signature? It's a question you should definitely answer. What what elements come come back? Right? Is there an ostinato, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Is there lots of syncopation, downbeats? Is it dense? Is it sparse? The tempo is usually a bit easier. Sometimes it's unchanging for an entire piece. If it's like a, a classical piece, it's it's usually more interesting, uh, and then you can comment on. Um, all these elements being used, like like ritenuto, accelerando, fermata, um, tempo changes, uh, commas, things things like that. Um, try to determine how fast or slow it is. 
And then you spin it again and try to figure out the dynamic uh, flow of the piece. So you can make a graphic representation, which is kind of fun, which it's just a line that goes up when it gets louder and, and down when it gets softer, like a seismograph, you know? Um, and it's interesting to look back at, at, at this and see how, how much development there is throughout a piece, or maybe even see if you can write something with the dynamic layout of, of, of a piece that you like, right? Um, and then there's some additional observations which don't really belong to any of the parameters, but uh, are kind of important to know because uh, they can help you understand the piece, right? So what is the background of the piece who wrote it, obviously, um, for what occasion? Um, this word zeitgeist might not be familiar for everybody. It's it's a German meaning something like the spirit of the times. So so in what way can you tell that a piece that's written in 1980 is written in 1980, other than lots of synths and snares with heaps of reverb, right? Um, how does the music make you feel? Does it make you happy? Does it make you cry? Does it make you dance? Uh, anything goes, right? Um, and also they're, they're an interesting uh, property of music is that it can transport you uh, to a certain situation that you've been in, a certain memory, you know. Uh, and this one is, is also very useful. So how would you describe the, the piece you're listening to, to someone who doesn't know anything about music. Um, so in other words, how do you make something abstract, presuming we're, we're talking about instrumental music? Um, how do you put something abstract into words for, for someone who doesn't speak jargon? Yeah. Um, so this is a helpful, helpful start. Um, and this I will also send you. So here's another list of those those uh, parameters. Um, so this listening exercise is a first step in, in using these parameters to analyze music, um, which obviously you can zoom in deeper, right? So I try to determine like the music that I listen to, um, is it so meaningful, so beautiful to me because of the tempo or is it more because of the rhythms being used or is it more because of the sound quality or is it more because of the melody, right? And that way I try to kind of isolate these aspects of the music, uh, allowing me to kind of borrow them or steal them for my own use without uh, copying the, the entire piece or the style, right? Um, it says here, and this might be offensive and I do apologize, um, copying and blending together different styles, right? And producing the worst music of all, fusion, um, which is only allowed in cooking. Um, so personally, I, I like harmony of the 20th century. I really love this, the, this intricate kind of more chromatic harmony. So I spent a lot of time trying to figure it out, uh, making harmonic reductions of the score, writing chord symbols above it, seeing how the modulations work, how the voice leaning works. Um, I like hip hop quite a bit. I'll show you an example later. Um, and most notably the, the phrasing, um, often kind of stopping and starting in unexpected places and, and uh, um, kind of more, more downbeat focused than jazz, generally speaking. Um, and yeah, uh, whatever you like. Uh, I like melodies of, of, of folk music. I like um, uh, free improv quite a bit, especially when it's played live. I don't listen to it so much on, on record, um, but I really enjoy the way that um, research is being done by people who play free improv on the use of extended techniques and weird ways of using your instrument in your body. and. Um, so these are all kind of things I try to incorporate and I try to be specific about the parameter in which these things are, are happening. Um, so 
like I mentioned before, it's really hard to just sit down and start writing the, the Beethoven's Ninth, you know, and, and hoping for something to come out. So personally, for me, what is much more effective is to have kind of a plan. Uh, I have a bunch of concepts available that are either things I want to try out or, or consequences of analyzing the music that I like. Um, so I might figure something out about uh, uh, a certain harmonic progression or a certain rhythm that I dig. And then I give myself a time frame. So this is an important point, usually four to six hours. And then I try to write as an exercise a piece that is fully finished within, within four to six hours based on one of these concepts within the music that I like or something that I'm trying to figure out myself. Um, so I have a deadline and I try, and this also helps to not worry about the sounding result too much, right? So the goal is not to write something that's going to change the world forever. The goal is to practice composition in a similar way to practicing your, your instrument, right? So I have a couple of rules doing this. It has to be finished. It has to be notated correctly. And um, it has to be playable um, without needing um, any verbal explanation. Um, in other words, try to write your charts in such a way that you can send them to people without having to be present at the rehearsal, you know? So they should be precise and that, that saves you a lot of time during rehearsal. Um, and so the third point is also important. Uh, these parameters can really help analyze your own music with. And so, for example, you can take the three or four last pieces that you wrote and analyze them one parameter at a time and look for commonalities. So with harmony, for example, an obvious one is you might figure out, like, damn, everything I write is in F major, you know? Um, so then you have a place to start for your next composition, which will be a different key and minor, right? Uh, so that way you kind of ensure having enough variation in your output as opposed to intu intuitively writing the same music over and over again, right? Um, and so that, that's, this, that's true for each parameter. So the tempo is an important factor. Uh, you know, making sure the tempos in a set of music are, are not divisible by the, the same kind of uh, uh, pulse is an important way of, of ensuring that people will keep paying attention, you know. Um, and also try to incorporate some, some tempo markings that you normally don't use, like ritenutos, acceleranos, fermatas. Um, Melody, obviously, you know, so, so try not to use the same intervals all the time. Try not to start your phrases in the same spot in the bar all the time. Uh, think about upbeats, downbeats, think about uh, climax, think about uh, using a combination of leaps and jumps, you know, to keep the flow of the melody interesting. Uh, think about when you use chord tones, when you use extensions, anything like that. So again, you analyze the three or four pieces, preferably the, the last pieces you wrote, and see if some any unconscious habits come up where you're like, okay, that's probably not a deliberate stylistical choice, you know, uh, but more a consequence of being a bit too intuitive and and um, kind of going to your go-to methods and 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 uh, mechanisms too quickly, right? Um, and lastly, it's helpful when it comes to improvisation. So it's really interesting and do try this at home. So um, get together with, with some people if you can and, and um, come up with some directions for improv for each parameter, right? So dynamics, for example, uh, you can decide on you know, play, playing a crescendo over the course of two minutes and see what happens. Play a decrescendo collectively um, or, or something that keeps going louder and then super soft, super loud, super soft. Any kind of dynamic shape is interesting to try. But this is also true for, for composition, right? So this could be a, a starting point for a composition as well. 
is probably going to end up sounding different from, from what you've done so far. Um, again, you're trying out new things. These are all exercises and you don't necessarily uh, want this to end up on your next record, you know, but rather you're practicing, uh, focusing on different parameters and, and practicing notation, practicing finishing things, practicing not judging yourself. Um, and you can write pieces that have different parameters written down. Um, so for example, you can, you can, even when you work with classically trained musicians, you can have them improvise the form by, for example, determining how often they repeat something. You can ask them to improvise the texture. You can ask them to improvise the dynamics and the tempo, right? So generally speaking, as soon as you ask them to improvise the note values, the pitches, it becomes a bit more difficult. Um, so there's an interesting kind of spectrum there between um, through, through composed music in which everything is written down meticulously and, and free improv and everything in between, right? So analyze your own music. Uh, it's also helpful to categorize your, your ideas for each parameter. Um, like, okay, I have my kind of my harmonic systems that I want to develop, my melodic ideas that I want to make, that I want to make part of my style. Um, so hopefully this makes you aware of kind of all the, the uh, ingredients of your music a little bit more. Um, so try to practice, don't, don't judge yourself, use a time frame. see what your habits are. Um, and then there's the interesting case of uh, the interesting um, discussion of intuition versus craft or um, intellect, you know, which we can talk about later. Um, so I'll give you a few examples quickly uh, of how I try to integrate music that I that I love into, into my own writing and playing, right? Um, So I'm a big fan of this guy, Andre 3000, who is one half of Outcast. So this is a slightly quantized uh, transcription of his verse. I took a little bit out here um, because I I don't I don't because I liked it better I guess. Um, so this is phrasing first, simple as that, right? So so the idea is you start your composition or a solo with the phrasing, and this could be. Um, transcribed from anything you like, a jazz solo or a bird song or human speech or, um, or hip hop verse like, like this. So to, to be clear, I transcribed his, the, the rhythm of his vocals, right? Um, and this phrasing first kind of idea is a helpful way of just getting started writing a composition, but it's also helpful when you improvise, especially in a harmonically complex setting because it makes something other than the harmony, the priority, and it makes it um, so that it has a very strong logic. Um, so this is what it sounds like applied to giant steps. Oh yeah, groovy, Sibelius, midi, but you, you get the idea, right? So three steps here, you transcribe the rhythm of something you like, um, and you uh, add a, a harmonic framework. So this could be a standard, but it could also be a harmonic reduction of a classical piece or something you've composed. Um, and thirdly, you add pitches 
to to the rhythm, right? That coincide with with the harmony, or not? If you're feeling crazy, um, so pretty simple idea, but very very helpful um, in in working on phrasing and kind of finding a purpose for for um, all the hours of listening to hip hop that a lot of us um, do. Um, so this is one example of, of kind of this parameter approach, obviously in the parameter rhythm, right? Um, there's a lot more to say about rhythm, but for time's sake, let's move on to, to melody. So just quickly, an example that kind of blew my mind. This is something that Barbara Bly, who was a theory teacher, uh, pointed out to me. And she wrote a beautiful paper on this, which you can find online. Um, on three uh, pieces by Wayne Shorter. Um, I guess most of you are familiar with this piece. It's very beautiful. Um, and what I like oh, a lot about this is that infant eye sounds very intuitive and mysterious and, and, and uh, pretty and heartfelt. But then when you analyze it, um, there is a, a super conceptual starting point, um, which to me is kind of the proof of the pudding, right? That that um, um, Wayne Shorter ha has his ways of getting started with the composition and he's quite a conceptual composer. Um, but as we will see later on, he's also not afraid to destroy his own system. Um, so the, the central idea here is that each first note of every bar forms a, a little blues melody that is stretched out. Um, so if you would sing all the long notes here, you would get da di da di da 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 da, and then the bridge, di da do di da 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 do, and then da di do di da 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 da, right? So line up all the first notes of each bar and it spells out a, a very rudimentary blues melody. Um, so the odds of this being a coincidence, I think are, are quite small, but you never know, you know, crazy things do happen, but it's much more reasonable to kind of assume that this is how he started writing this piece of music, right? So he took a melody and he stretched it out and, and probably wrote a whole note per bar which also kind of explains this strange nine bar structure. And um, uh, my best guess is that he then filled in the, the um, harmony and then embellished the melody, right? So this is something you will never pick up on because it's, it's way too slow to kind of notice this. But interestingly to me, this piece definitely sounds bluesy and it does sound like it has a strong logic behind it. It doesn't just come out of nowhere. Um, and it's definitely not uh, just 100% intuitive, right? There's enough room for intuition. I guess he just chose harmony that, you know, it chose chords that he liked. He chose the embellishments that he liked, you know, he uh, probably messed around with the tempo before he fi figured out it, it was a ballad, who knows, you know? So there's a lot of room for, for intuition, a lot of room for inspiration, whatever you want to call it, uh, but it's super, super helpful and also provides a strong logic to a piece if you have like a clear concept, concept to start with. Um, so this technique is actually related to um, a contest fermus, which, which, which in counterpoint is like a, a fixed voice that everything else is based off of. Um, so this doesn't just, just, uh, um, you know, rarely does something really come out of nowhere, you know? Um, so there's this one note, this A natural that doesn't fit, uh, the exact transposition, transposition of this melody. So, da -di -da -di -da -do -do -do. so this is the variation, right? And I guess he, he just chose it because he he liked it better, you know, which to me is is um, 
a great reminder that that you shouldn't be too rigid about your concepts and, and, and systems. Um, and so the consequence is a, a, a heartbreakingly beautiful piece of music that I believe is about seven and a half minutes, you know, and I doubt that he explained any, any of this to his fellow musicians, but it's a great way to get started writing and you still kind of pick up on his logic um, subconsciously, or at least that's what I, what I would argue. Um, so very interesting example for, for the parameter melody. And so you can try this yourself, this same technique. So you pick a melody or you compose a melody, you stretch it out one bar, one note per bar, and then all the other parameters you're free to change. So you could apply the same principle, but do it in a faster tempo with a different time signature, different harmony, a different melody, obviously. So you, you might end up with something that doesn't sound anything like infant eyes, right? And this is kind of the kind of system or concept that I try to um, look for in the music that I love because it allows you to create your own music with it without sounding too much like the original. Um, so maybe one or two more examples. I'll send you this handout as well as the listening exercise so you can, you can look at it um, in the comfort of your own homes or outside. And um, so let's look at form for a little bit. Um, I enjoy trying these forms of, of uh, classical music that are well known and, and are kind of developed throughout the ages, um, which just tend to work very well. Um, and there's a huge list on Wikipedia called musical form um and it lists all the all the kind of common forms used throughout um, the development of classical music so one famous example is the sonata allegro form which is kind of odd it's not something you would probably think of intuitively um, but it's really interesting to try this when you have let's say two themes and you're not sure how to how to proceed right um, so sonata Allegro form. The very, very rudimentary version of this is um, A, theme one, B, theme two. A is in the first degree and B is in the fifth, the dominant degree. This is one of these is in major, but you can find out more about this um, on Wikipedia also. The, the, the page on Sonata form is very thorough. This usually repeats. So this section is called exposition. Um, then the next section is development, which could be anything really, but usually um, it's modulatory. Um, another term for this is roving harmony, meaning it has a lot of flux. It has a lot of uh, change and it doesn't land on a particular key center for too long. This is very generally speaking. Um, so things happen in the development section, but it could even be improvised, right? Usually the development is based on somehow on the, on the material that came before. Um, and then the third section, third and last is the um, let's see if we can stretch this out. Recapitulation. This is A, so theme one again, and B again, so theme two. But the interesting thing here is that both theme one and both theme two, two are in the home key. Um, so here, theme two is in the dominant key generally speaking, when the piece is in major and at the end, it's in the, in the home key. And so this is what really provides kind of um, a sense of release and a sense of, okay, the piece has come to an end and we're, we're, we're back home, right? This is a very, very interesting form to try. It's a little intimidating because it's, it's, it's not AABA, you know, but 
On the other hand, it's not rocket science. If you have two themes and you kind of throw, throw them in the generator, um, interesting things might happen, right? Um, I'll show you an example of one of these um, etudes, you know, exercises that I that I did with it, um, where I tried to write something within a certain time frame. I believe this was slightly longer, probably like eight eight hours. Um, Yeah, so the, the harmony here is, is a bit weird, you know, it's very angular and kind of um, um, intuitive, but, but the form is actually very simple, right? And it's kind of uh, meant to, um, you know, you're making friends with new forms. So again, try, try not to uh, judge yourself too harshly. You're just trying things out. So see if you can write a, a sonata like this maybe a rondo. Um, this is a piece by Joris Rulofs. The, the chart just says this, you know, and it's meant as directions for improv, meaning you have an initial idea, which you repeat, and then on cue, everybody goes to the next idea. And on cue, everybody goes back to the first idea. On cue, you go to a third idea. On cue, you go back to the first idea, etc. cetera. Uh, really interesting thing to try. Also an improvisation. Um, we probably won't have time to talk about the others, but, um, and so try to be aware of the dynamics. It's also a nice parameter to start writing from, um, texture. I will say, uh, most importantly to me is to, uh, to know about the instruments that you write for. So this is, a, is, is kind of, a the standard in terms of literature, a book called The Study of Orchestration by, by Samuel Adler, um, which, is, which is kind of a, uh, an encyclopedia. It's not the type of book you read from page one to page 900, uh, although you can if you want to, um, but it teaches you about all the intricacies and, and, and um, characteristics of, of the individual instruments, but also how they work together uh, what ranges are comfortable and how a change in the, the register influences the, the, the quality of the sound, um, all things, things like that. Um, so just very helpful stuff to know if you're serious about composing. If you have a band that you write for, see if you can, um, you know, buy a cheap saxophone or a cheap guitar or uh, whatever it is. That your band members play some some cheap drums, you know. Um, there's I, I bought my kid a, a guitar for thirty five euros, and it's 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 incredible, you know. It's it's this big, but it it works and it sounds sounds pretty good. I, I don't know how they do it. Um, so if you write for 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 guitar, you know, see if the voicings work. If you write for trumpet, you know, see if you can mess around with it. Um, to the detriment of your neighbors and your face. And um, there's some ideas here for, for things to try. This is a famous book by Hermeto Pas Pasqual called Calendario do Son or Sound Calendar. Um, so he wrote a new composition every day for a, a year. 
and it was a leap year so it's 366 pieces um, not all of them are um, a work of genius but they're sure as hell um, at least very good all of them um, and let's see yeah some ideas for for um, exercises based on, on the different parameters. Some general composition advice. Um, most importantly, I would urge you to approach composition as something that you need to practice and not something. Um, I tried to word this out this afternoon, but um, there seems to be, to me, a, a, a very romantic notion of composition. And I'm also uh, very guilty of this myself. Um, so when whenever we practice our instruments, we are not afraid to analyze everything to death, you know, and practice all the permutations and scales and, and subdivisions and polyrhythms and record ourselves and analyze it. and, and you know, think about how we can improve and um, spend hours and hours uh, in the in the shed. And then as soon as it comes to composition, a, a lot of people uh, turn into hopeless romantics instantly, you know, like uh, I have to write um, how I feel and, and, you know, use a goose feather and you wait for divine inspiration and, um, just hoping for something to come out naturally. Um, and to me, you know, I, 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 I'm the first to admit that I, that I thought about writing music this way. Um, but as I've progressed as, as a composer, I, I find out more and more that a lot of it is a craft, right? Which you need to practice a lot because it's very, very complicated. And, um, to me, this doesn't take away anything of the, the, the kind of inspiration and um, um, quite the contrary. It makes you quicker in um, getting your ideas across and translating them to the paper. Uh, and it, it, it trains your kind of your imagination. Um, and it's most of all saves you a lot of time if you know about counterpoint, if you know about orchestration, if you know about form, and um, and if you know about notation, right, you, you can become very, very quick at, at notation software uh, by doing these exercises, saving you a lot of time. So often when you work as a composer, when you're commissioned, you have too little time to start with. Um, and there's always a deadline. And I always try to finish a few weeks before I have to hand it in, but I have i don't think I've ever succeeded, although it's getting a little better. Um, so it's good to develop a lot of technique um, and technique again, meaning a counterpoint notation, orchestration, um, imagination. Um, so hopefully this, this gives you, gives you some, some, some places to start uh, for practicing composition. Um, try not to judge yourself too harshly. Um, try out new things um, without worrying about the sounding result too much. So try to do an exercise like, like this, maybe a few times a week, give yourself a time frame. It doesn't have to be long. You don't have to write 15 minutes of music. Try to write 30 seconds for all, for all I care. As long as it's finished, and that means it should have a title as well. It should be notated correctly um, or, or recorded, what, whatever your, your um, MO is. And um, yeah, some, some, some more advice here. Um, this is an interesting one related to what I just mentioned. Parkinson's law says work expands so as to fill the time available for its completion. Meaning something like the more time you have, um, the more time it will take you to finish something, right? Uh, which again, this, this 
sticking to a time frame when you're doing exercises like this is is, is probably um, together with not judging yourself too harshly. Are, those are probably the most important points. So the seven parameters, harmony, melody, rhythm, tempo, form, texture, and dynamics. Analyze the music that you love, analyze your own music, use them as a place to, to get started. Um, use them to vary the degrees of improvisation. Um, and uh, yeah, happy hunting. <laughs>